Yeah. 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 Surah from the Quran before we start the program. Could you please? Yeah. Yeah. Is the mic on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم في بيوت أذن الله أن ترفع ويذكر فيها اسمه يسبح له فيما بالغدو والآصال رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار ليجزيهم الله أحسن ما عملوا ويزيدهم من فضله والله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب صدق الله العظيم. Yeah, just turn the lights down. Yeah. If you could, please. <coughs> <laughs> well, welcome our Sunday lecture. I am very pleased to uh, introduce our very own uh, Sophie Afridi. <laughs> uh, Sophie was uh, born. No, I take it back. Um, Dr. Sophie Afridi. Usually we get in the habit of not recognizing them for their accomplishments because they were born in front of us and grew up 
and we still consider them little children. Right? <laughs> My apologies. So uh, she was born in Toledo, um, raised um, in Toledo in this uh, Islamic center. Uh, she um, attended the uh, University of Toledo College of Medicine, graduated, uh, and then she went to University of uh, Cincinnati for training as a vascular surgeon, peripheral vascular surgeon. Uh, she came back to our hometown and joined the practice of her father, who is a very well-known vascular surgeon in Toledo, Dr. Farooq Afridi. So here is a rare father and daughter combo that they have been practicing in Toledo. She specializes in uh, so many different areas of uh, vascular surgery. But other than her accomplishments that she has many, She's also a first-rated athlete who has done marathons, right? How many people <laughs> would do that? She is, and, uh, and she has been a superb athlete uh, ever since she was in school uh, and maintained that. Uh, she is going to talk to us about sugar, that how sugar is effect affecting our health. Mm -hmm. And this morning, uh, I learned uh, from, uh, I don't know who I learned it from, but I learned uh, that um, there was a campaign back in the 60s against salt. The salt is not good for you. And that campaign was supported and financed by the sugar lobby. Oh so. Go figure out. <laughs> so please welcome uh, Dr. Sophia Friedman. Yeah. Thank you for the nice introduction. I think this topic is good for Ramadan because, like, you know, I'm sure we all, if it's our time, just eat whatever we see, and if it's bad, sweet, you know, it doesn't matter as long as it's, you know, good. So I think this is very, very good talk for this time of year. So I'm going to talk about sugar and I'm going to talk about how it affects our body and the long-term effects of it. So some disclosures. Um, so I'm a vascular surgeon. I have really no formal training in this. Um, so most of my information is just uh, basic information that I learned from medical school. Um, I have just a personal interest in this just for health reasons. Um, uh, like Uncle said, I, I, I run a lot and try to, you know, try to be healthy. So I read a lot of books. So most of my information is from that. Um, which kind of ironically have no formal training in this as a vascular surgeon because a lot of our patients actually, you know, are affected by sugar. So it's kind of interesting we don't really have training in it. So just an introduction um, to start off with, and then we're going to talk about sugar itself. Um, we're going to talk about how sugar affects the body, and then we're going to talk about insulin. So we're going to talk about insulin resistance and how sugar affects um, uh, that part of our body. We're going to briefly talk about diabetes. Uh, just in the context of insulin resistance. And then we're going to talk about things you can do to prevent um, insulin resistance um, and how to know if maybe you are insulin resistant, how to test for that, uh, uh, what to look out for. And then Bruce is going to mention sugar and dopamine. Um, Auntie Majibi gave a talk a few weeks ago about addiction. So we'll mention that mm -hmm. in the context of sugar. And then just how to limit sugar in the body. So worldwide, we're suffering from diseases that used to be rare and we were dying. So each year, 10 million people die from cancer. Um, almost 20 million die from heart disease. 50 million people suffer from Alzheimer's. And 500 million or half a billion people have diabetes. And these are not diseases that were really widespread until very recently. And then we are also very unhealthy. So worldwide, 40% of adults are considered overweight or obese. Um, and half of men age 45 have low levels of testosterone, and almost 10% of women have menstrual irregularities and infertility. So in this presentation, we will learn how excess sugar in our diet can cause insulin resistance and how insulin resistance leads directly to chronic disease. So I'm not saying necessarily that all of these issues are due to sugar, but sugar definitely plays a big part in this. Um, and I think it's important that we understand the relationship between sugar and our diet and these chronic diseases. So what is sugar? So sugar is basically, it's a carbohydrate. So uh, it's a, 
uh, one of the macronutrients, macronutrients that your body uses to make energy, um, which also fat and protein. Um, it consists of, we'll go, we have a slide where I go down to individual sugars, but um, on the left side, this is sucrose, which is uh, two sugar molecules together. Um, glucose is on the left, fructose is on the right. Um, the, individually, each one is a molecule, and when they come together, they're called a, a disaccharide. Um, sugar is found in the sap of seed plants and in mammalian milk, we call lactose. So when we say sugar, we're usually referring to the most common form of sugar, which is sucrose, which is table sugar, which is a molecule of glucose and a molecule of fructose combined together. Um, we call it disaccharide, meaning it has a molecule, two molecules together, the dye comes from the two. So just another slide very quickly. So we have monosaccharides, which are basically just the one molecule you know, by itself, and that includes glucose, fructose, and galactose. So the fructose is um, uh, what we see in fruit. Um, galactose is what we see in milk. Disaccharide means that there's two sugar molecules together. Sucrose is what we call table sugar, and that's glucose and fructose. Um, lactose, maltose, and then starch would be complex, so those are more than 10 um, monosaccharides linked together. So we talk about starches and potatoes. Um, so glucose is the simplest form of sugar. It's absorbed directly into the bloodstream to be used by cells. Um, fructose, I'll just mention this because I have a slide later on. It's, like I said, it's fruit sugar. It's absorbed by the small intestine, but the liver must convert fructose to glucose to make it usable by the body. So we'll talk a little bit later about the downsides of that, but fructose, um, when it goes through the, me the metabolism of the liver, it can lead to fatty liver, and it can also cause the release of triglycerides and LDL. So we'll talk a little bit about that together. So sucrose comes from plants. So plants make the energy, they create sugar, um, and then um, make sucrose from carbon dioxide and water. So sugar is, or sucrose is found in almost all plants. Uh, we get most of our sugar from sugar cane and sugar beets, um, which are the highest concentrations of sugar. Um, it's the most commercially available source of sugar. Um, also, sugar maple, date palm are lesser sources of sugar maple and maple syrup. Um, sugar cane and sugar beets are the most available and the least economically, I don't know how to say it, the most available, commercially available uh, sugars to obtain and most commercially profitable. That's why we use that. Um, Sugar beets actually, interestingly, um, developed during the Napoleonic Wars in the early um, 1800s um, because the British blockaded continental Europe, so we couldn't get sugar cane from the West Indies. So um, Europe developed sugar beets to the use of sugar. So how does sugar affect the body? So what does sugar do? So when you eat something, um, your body takes glucose um, from the food. It breaks down the food into a uh, simple building blocks of glucose. Uh, glucose levels rise when you eat. And in general, from day to day, usually you don't have a lot of long-term problems just from eating. So you eat sugar or you eat food and it's broken down into glucose. It really doesn't cause much of a problem because your body has adapted to it. Um, in some situations, you can't metabolize the glucose, say if you're type one diabetic, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, large levels or high levels of glucose can cause rapid fluid loss and lead to hospitalization. So very, very high levels of sugar are not good for the body. Um, and that's on a short-term level, those are in special situations. Um, chronically elevated glucose levels, so people who have high levels of glucose, say in a type 2 diabetic, um, over time can lead to a number of issues. Um, they can damage the teeth, it can lead to dental caries, um, it can cause kidney damage, neuropathy, cardiovascular disease. Um, blindness, and it can make you susceptible to infection. So this is long-term people with high levels of sugar can't get the sugar down. These are the issues that happens. Um, insulin is a hormone which regulates glucose um, at a day-to-day -day level. So hormones are basically um, messengers in the body. So they're, they're chemicals that are released from one part of the body to communicate with another. Um, insulin is a hormone that's released from the pancreas, which is um, an organ in the belly. It's kind of um, kind of in your upper abdomen, um, kind of like the size of my hand, um, right below your rib cage. It has special cells, among other things, it has special mm -hmm. cells called islets of Langerhans, uh, which release insulin into the bloodstream and basically act on um, body cells. So food we eat gets broken down to carbohydrates, we call sugar, for layman's term. 
um, insulin gets released from the pancreas. And what insulin does is when blood glucose levels are elevated, um, insulin acts all through the body, but it opens up channels um, in cells and allows the cells to take glucose inside the cell. Um, body needs glucose for energy. So every tissue in the body pretty much uses glucose and insulin pretty much affects every tissue in the body, which is uh, very unusual for a hormone. So um, eat insulin or glucose goes up in the bloodstream, sends signals to your body, um, to your pancreas to create insulin. Insulin goes through the body and acts on channels onto the cells, which open the doors, which allow glucose to go into the cell. And then um, uh, glucose levels in the blood will then go down because their cells have absorbed the glucose. We consider it an anabolic hormone, which means that it builds up the cells, so the cells are able to make bigger molecules. And then each cell is affected differently by insulin. Um, so in liver cells, it makes fat, muscle cells, um, um, you know, makes protein, etc. So I, I just mentioned this just for the picture basically, but insulin goes through the whole body um, and basically just acts on a different um, body in different, different ways. So insulin resistance, so if you have too much glucose in the body over a long period of time, um, that normal function, this is the picture at the top, this normal function, um, your body starts to downregulate the insulin receptors. So after a while, um, insulin levels, or glucose levels are chronically high. So the glucose levels are lower red balls. Um, glucose levels are chronically high. Um, insulin is, is working on the cells very um, efficiently, but after a while, the cells kind of get worn out for lack of a better term. And your body will downregulate the insulin receptors. So you can see from the top slide and the bottom slide, um, you don't have as many receptors anymore. So your body has to make more insulin um, to act on the limited amount of receptors. So over time, the, the insulin receptors get downregulated, glucose increases, you must, your body has to make more insulin to, to compensate for that. We call it the compensated phase. Um, that's what we call insulin resistance. Um, eventually, the body cannot produce enough insulin and circulating glucose levels remain high. We call that diabetes. So what's the problem with that? Well, elevated levels of insulin have many effects on the body. Um, I mentioned insulin causes um, muscle cells to, to, to grow, but it can also cause um, fat cells to proliferate, so it can lead to obesity um, and weight gain. Um, it also releases fatty acids. Um, it um, causes um, endothelial cells to grow, so the endothelial cells are the lining of the blood vessels. So the lining of the blood vessels have cells and they kind of make like a, a, a tube, like a water slide. Um, insulin causes those cells to grow, so then those cells proliferate and cause narrowing of the blood vessel cells. Um, it also impairs vasodilation, so vasodilation is your body's natural way to dilate the blood vessels and impairs that. So the cells get, uh, or the blood vessels get thick and they get stiff so they don't dilate um, in response to blood flow. So basically causes hypertension. Um, inflammatory cells are, uh, become more active, enter the, the um, uh, are released from cells, which become um, you know, a leader of a marker of inflammation in the body. And pretty much anything bad you can think about is caused by insulin resistance over time. So I don't, I won't go through the whole thing, but pretty much anything bad is caused by insulin resistance. So just if it's bad, it's insulin resistance probably. So we talk about insulin resistance. So someone can go on for a long time and be insulin resistant. Probably, you know, 20, 15, 20 years or so, you could be insulin resistant and you may not know it. Um, and you're not diabetic, so you go to your doctor, um, you know, blood sugar is checked, you're be fine, okay. Um, but that whole time you may be insulin resistant and not know it. And then we talked about the late stages of insulin resistance is diabetes, and this is a term that we all had heard about. So diabetes is two types. So there's type one and type two. So type one is the body's unable to make insulin. So this is about five to 10% of diabetics. This is an autoimmune disorder where the beta cells, like I showed you, um, that make insulin are destroyed um, by the body. Um, insulin is necessary for survival. So before um, insulin was invented, these people would not survive because they did not have insulin um, so that they couldn't absorb any glucose and they would just literally die in their teens and 20s. 
um, type 2 diabetes mellitus is a disease of insulin resistance. So this is what we're used to seeing. Um, so this is what we talked about before. So insulin is release the response. Um, so the insulin receptors kind of downregulate over time. We need excess insulin um, to compensate for the decreased receptors. And then eventually the insulin cells can't make enough insulin. They kind of burn out. Um, and then that's what you end up with diabetes. Um, so they're both have different symptoms and different disease progression. So we should start, should start thinking of type 2 diabetes as a disease of insulin resistance. Um, kind of historically, if you look back early on, um, early physicians didn't really recognize the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetics. Just, they all kind of are the same thing. So if you look historically in the physician record, 3,000 years ago in Egypt, there's a papyrus that talks about patients who had too great an emptying of the urine. So the, they were talking about type 1 diabetic. Um, and then physicians in ancient India noticed people produce urine that attracted insects like honey. Um, because what happens in, in um, when you have too high blood glucose levels, it, it's excreted by the urine, um, and that makes the urine very, very sticky. Um, and mellitus, where we use diabetes mellitus, is actually Latin for honey sweet. Um, in ancient Greece, the disease was named diabetes, which means to pass through, because patients produce a large amount of urine, especially in the type 1 di diabetics. Um, but it wasn't until the 5th century that physicians noticed two types. Um, so young people who could not gain weight and who just had lots of, of urine output, sticky, sticky urine, and older people who um, kind of developed this disease later on, they realized that these were two separate diseases. Um, so before we recognized that there were uh, two types of diseases, um, we would test for glucose uh, in the bloodstream, okay? So both types were noted to have increased glucose in the urine. Um, but for type 2 diabetics, this was later on. So glucose was easy to check for because just an enzyme, you know, your um, glucometer or even just your dipstick. Um, but insulin was very difficult to measure. We actually didn't have a test for insulin um, until the 1950s. So the focus on, I, I think we tend to focus more on uh, glucose levels I think in, in practice, we tend to form more on glucose levels, I think because of these historical um, kind of precedents and lack of understanding early on of type 1 and type 2 diabetics. Um, but we should be focusing on insulin levels if we're our aim is to prevent diabetes. So insulin resistance, so kind of backing up a little bit, so diabetes, um, early on or early on, we didn't really recognize the two. And our test primarily to, to, to see if someone had diabetes was to check their glucose levels. But if you're a type 2 diabetic, or if you're pre-diabetic, or even before that you're insulin resistant, your, your glucose levels may be normal. So we're sort of missing a large segment of the population when we don't test, when we just focus on glucose as a test. So for insulin resistance, we can check for um, insulin levels, okay? So insulin um, resistance can precede diabetes by 20 years or so. Um, your levels of insulin may be high because your body's working harder to compensate for the decreased receptors, um, but it's still working. So your glucose levels in the blood may be normal. Um, so checking someone's glucose may not give you the full picture. Um, so this is eventually they'll, they'll go on and diabetics will have um, high insulin, or sorry, high glucose levels because insulin is kind of burned out. So I think we focus more on diabetic um, as a glucose disease, but now we know it's more of a disease of insulin resistance. So, so now you're asking, am I at risk for insulin resistance? So these are some questions um, to ask yourself. Um, do you have excess fat around the abdomen? Um, there's a relationship between visceral fat, which is the fat inside the inside of the um, abdomen around the intestines. It's directly linked to insulin resistance. Um, so uh, the common test is you can grab your abdomen, and if you can grab the fat, that's subcutaneous fat, and that's probably the better fat. But if you can't grab it, that's fat that's inside of your abdomen around the blood vessels, or sorry, around the organs. Um, do you have high blood pressure, family history of heart disease, high levels of blood triglycerides, do you retain water easily, do you get swollen if you drink too much water, um, patches, darker colored skin, and skin tags on the neck and armpit. Um, family member with type 2 diabetes, and then if you're a woman, polycystic ovarian syndrome can be a sign of um, insulin resistance, 
and if you're a man, erectile dysfunction. So very quickly, let's talk about prevention. So um, assessing your diet and lifestyle and your, your risks of insulin resistance um, are a good way to start. My risk for insulin resistance um, based on these factors that we talked about back here. Um, you can get your insulin levels checked. I don't know if this is something that's very common. I'm quite honest with you, can speak to this more. Yes. It's, can't, it, but it's not done routinely. It's though, not done it? routinely. Correct. Okay. Specific conditions. Specific conditions. So there might be something just to talk to your um, practitioner about. Um, when you're eating, try to control carbohydrates, try to limit sugar. They talk about glycemic index and glycemic load. I have a slide that talks about that. Um, but eat foods that are low on the glycemic index, low glycemic low foods. Um, don't drink fruit. I think I have a, I think I have a slide later on about that, but fruit is, well, I have a slide later on about talking about that. Fruit juice is something to be avoided. Um, exercise is very important. Um, we talk about resistance training versus aerobic exercise, and both are good because it helps to reduce weight. Um, but resistance training is best for insulin resistance because um, just by moving your muscles, um, your muscles pick up glucose because your muscles need energy. So it just grabs glucose from the bloodstream um, to use for energy. So if you're sitting for a long period of time and you have glucose in your bloodstream, just start moving around and your muscles will grab up that extra glucose. They don't even need insulin uh, to do that. And it can act like kind of like a sink to pick up glucose from the bloodstream. Um, and then resistance training over time, like lifting weights, not necessarily heavy weights, but just building muscle mass um, the more muscle you have, the more of a glucose sink your body has to pick up the extra um, glucose in the body. Um, people always talk about plant-based diet, meaning avoiding animal products. Um, actually, for insulin resistance, from what I could research, it isn't necessarily better, actually, um, it's in terms of insulin resistance. Uh, I put intermittent fasting here. I think this is an area that's just kind of emerging in the research. Um, but I have seen some studies, um, people who fast for 24 hours, even just once a month, are half as likely to be insulin resistant. Um, and then there's some evidence um, eating fewer larger meals is better than several smaller meals throughout the day. So I remember probably, you know, I think this was a common 15, 20 years ago, the common um, recommendation was to eat frequently during the day so you didn't stress out your pancreas. So you're, you always had like, like um, the similar levels of glucose in your body. But now actually we're starting to realize that's actually not good. It's better to eat uh, fewer larger meals um, to decrease the amount of insulin in, in, in your body, um, to restrict your insulin um, rise to certain times of the day. So it's kind of a change in the, the thinking. Um, another strategy if you're trying to avoid insulin resistance is only eat during specific windows of the day. So there's different uh, ways people have to do this. So some people will skip breakfast and just eat like they'll go 16 hours without eating, so they'll eat dinner at seven o'clock and then you know, sleep all night, skip breakfast, and then eat lunch at 11 o'clock and then just have lunch and dinner. Um, and, or you can cut out you know, sleep breakfast and, and lunch and cut out dinner. Um, some people um, you know, on the weekends will eat, you know, go 24 hours without eating, there's different ways uh, to do it. But the goal of that is to limit the amount of insulin in your body um, to decrease the risk of insulin resistance. So the science behind uh, intermittent fasting is due to hormones. So when you fast, insulin drops quickly um, because you're not eating. Um, the antagonist of insulin is, is glucagon. So glucagon is an energy spending hormone. So what it does is it causes fat cells to release um, glucose um, and um, decreases glucose um, in the bloodstream. Um, we mentioned dairy, I mentioned dairy and fermented food. So um, I don't really have a lot of evidence with this, but I have seen some studies that um, people who eat a lot of dairy are actually protected against uh, for diabetes. Um, I think it's more of a correlational um, kind of kind of uh, studies, but I have seen some um, some studies that show milk actually increases insulin sensitivity, and I don't really have understand the science behind it yet. Uh, fermented foods, um, the, the Yogurts, kimchi, um, um, kefir, things like that, um, contain probiotics, which also have a beneficial effect on insulin. Um, again, the science I think is still kind of new, and they also show slow down the absorption of food from the gut, mm -hmm. so that helps with insulin 
um, decrease insulin resistance as well. So very briefly, we talk about glycemic index and glycemic load. So this is a word that you see floating around when we talk about insulin resistance. So I think they're both useful information uh, for us. So glycemic index will tell you how much sugar um, is in a food. So basically how much, when you eat it, how much it's going to, um, like how much is the glucose going to rise in your bloodstream. <coughs> glycemic load is a little bit more complex than that. It helps predict blood glucose response. So it kind of looks at like the, the, the type of food and other factors related to the food. Maybe it has a, um, a high amount of carbohydrates, but it's the kind of carbohydrates that rise very slowly in your bloodstream. So glycemic load will kind of take that into um, consideration, so more like the quality um, of the food you eat. So something like fruit may have a, a high glycemic index because it's all sugar, um, but a low glycemic load because the fibers and, and the water in the fruit will start to will slow down the absorption of it. So just useful tools, and you can go online, there's apps on the phone to, to look into to kind of assess the glycemic index or load of food. I think glycemic load is probably better for using just for guidelines for what to eat. I think it's probably just a little bit more comprehensive, um, but glycemic index probably has this value as well. So I was very interested in artificial sweetener. Just feel like everything is artificial sweetener. Uh, but there's not much data, um, really, and all, well, most of the artificial sweeteners are different enough that I, I think it's really hard to come to consensus of what's like good and what's bad. Um, so there are studies that show artificial sweeteners do increase the risk of insulin resistance, and I don't think that's all artificial sweeteners, it's a variety of them. Um, but I did find a study in 2009, um, people who drink diet soda have a higher 36% greater chance of develop, developing metabolic syndrome, and a 67% higher chance of developing diabetes too. How? Well, I don't think that we really know why. Um, I think that maybe people feel like it's just it's empty calories, so they feel like they can eat more. Is a psychological thing. Um, you know, I'm Big Mac and fries, so I'll get a diet soda, so it's okay even I'm eating a Big Mac and fries. Um, or there's also some studies that show that um, because artificial sweeteners taste sweet, so your body thinks that you're going, it prepares for a carbohydrate load, so it releases insulin um, in response to that. So it's kind of like a brain uh, gut connection. Um, and then thus that increases your insulin. Um, although the study that they did uh, was only in people who were eating food. So if you just drink like a diet soda, um, you didn't have that response, the insulin response, but if you drink diet soda and eat a meal, you did have that response. So it's like your body's kind of preparing for it. Um, I mentioned high fructose corn syrup because I, I don't think there's anything good that can be said about it. Um, it's something that if you're avoiding artificial sweeteners, if any you're going to avoid, I think that's probably the one to avoid. So it's basically, it's a sweetener made from cornstarch. So the starch is broken down to glucose using enzymes. Um, and then it's further produced to convert some of that glucose into fructose. Um, so we talked earlier, fructose in large amounts has been linked to fatty liver and obesity. Um, and that's because the body has to pass fructose through the liver um, to create glucose. Um, and that over time can lead to um, uh, increased triglycerides, LDL, fatty liver. Um, the non-alcoholic, um, the NASH, non-alcoholic um, fatty liver was actually not really a widespread disease until like the 1980s. And I don't think we can say it's because of high fructose corn syrup, but we didn't really use high fructose corn syrup until then. So I don't know if correlation applies causation, but um, it's definitely a disease that we see more of, but we didn't see it before. Um, we talked about um, the hormones in your in your body stimulate the brain to let it know it's full. Um, somehow fructose doesn't um, stimulate the brain to let let you know it's you're full. So if you eat high fructose corn syrup, your body doesn't get those signals like, hey, I'm done eating, um, the way uh, glucose does. So it's something kind of maybe leads to overeating. So, uh, and the hormone is called ghrelin. Um, so, oh, sorry. It also increases a hormone called ghrelin. So ghrelin is a hormone that makes you feel hungry. Um, and so somehow, again, I don't understand the mechanics of it, but somehow it increases this hormone. 
so that you tend to feel hungry and you tend to overeat. So a lot of um, side effects with that. So I was researching this and okay, we were talking about fructose and how bad fructose is for you. Well, fructose is fruit sugar and sugar has a ton of fruit. So is fruit okay? Um, well, uh, fructose, like we said, can cause an increased amount of visceral fat. Um, and um, basically you see the main culprit is fruit juice. So fruits actually have fructose, but they have a lower level than fruit juice or high fructose corn syrup. And fruit also has fiber and water, which allows, which slows down fructose absorption. So fruit is actually shown to be um, okay. It actually doesn't spike your insulin um, levels as much as just pure fructose from fruit juice. Um, so actually fruit's okay to eat in small and normal amounts. Um, and the way I think of it too is, and this isn't scientific, is you know, we have, you know, lived for a long time with fruits, we've adapted to fruits, fruits have been, you know, coexisting with humans for a long time, they're natural, I think it's okay. So fruits are okay. So I put this in here just because we had a nice talk a few weeks ago about addiction. Um, I think the science is still out there, but is sugar addictive? And uh, absolutely it is. So sugar um, causes a spike in dopamine, which is that feel-good um, hormone in our, in our brain. Um, and the more you eat, the more those hormones spike. And these are just a bunch of studies. I just searched sugar, is sugar as addictive as cocaine? I would have searched that, and these are all the articles that popped up. So um, they studied rats, and they gave rats cocaine, they gave the rats sugar, and literally had the same uh, physiological response and the same brain scans as the cocaine addicted sugar, or the cocaine addicted rats. So in the brain, it looks the same. Um, people who are addicted to opioids, um, somehow their, their brain is more wired um, for addiction and it's very easy for them to get addicted to sugar as well. So there's some kind of lateral um, kind of uh, transference there. Um, here's our Oreos addictive research says yes. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of evidence, and I don't know if it's if it's fair to say it's as addictive as cocaine because you know cocaine is a is a very bad drug, um, but it does seem like it stimulates the same brain pathways and neural the neural pathways that that drugs do. And food companies have figured this out. So uh, food company, I mean everything has sugar in it, and food companies know that you get addicted to sugar, so they. I swear they, they know this and they put sugar in everything so that you eat more of it. And not only that, but um, food companies, which are a huge, you know, money making corporation, um, they make combinations of food that don't exist in nature, but we just get addicted to. So like sugar and salt, this does not exist in nature. So you don't eat like um, those pretzels with the you know, sugar on that doesn't exist in nature. Those, those taste um, relationships don't exist in nature. So I, I think food companies know that, and I think that, you know, not to sound conspiratorial, but I think that that's um, a ploy that actually I think they're using against us. So I just mentioned it just for that, that reason and just to be aware. So how much sugar do we eat? So this um, is our, uh, video I found from Rachel Ray, I'll see if it works. Um, but this is something I kind of did during my day, I just kind of realized you know, or I just kind of was aware of how much sugar I was eating. So I would eat breakfast, look at the cereal. Oh, okay, there's 11 grams of sugar in this. Okay, now I'm having a cookie for lunch. And so I just kind of to visualize how much sugar we're actually eating. This is a nice video. Of course, such a nice video. That was a really cool video. <laughs> but basically, I don't know if you can see it, but well, basically, this man goes on Rachel Ray and he's like, you know, every day we, you know, 39 teaspoons of sugar, and then he actually pours the sugar into how much how much you eat in a day, and he pours it into like two big glasses of water or like cups, and he's like, this is how much we eat in a, in a, in a week, um, and then he brings in like like this dolly with like. 50 bags of domino sugar, and this is how much you eat in a year, and it's like, it's very alarming, actually. And I wish you could see it, but I can't see it to work, so. Okay. So how much sugar is okay? None. 
Um, so, <laughs> so actually the World Health Organization recommends no more than 10% of daily calories come from sugar. Um, and additional benefits of sugar consumption is below 5% of daily calories. So I have no idea how many calories I'm supposed to eat, you know, 2,000, I, I don't know. Um, but what they did is they actually handily uh, calculated it for you. So um, they recommended 25 grams of sugar, um, which is six teaspoons. Um, if you're reading labels, four grams of sugar is one teaspoon. Sometimes they report it in grams if your own recipe is teaspoons. Um, I think it's just kind of a general rule of thumb. I did see something out there that um, I looked on the WHO website, and this is what they recommended. But I did read an article that said, you know, if you're a man and you have higher caloric intake, that can be 50 grams of sugar, and a woman is 25 grams. Or when I went to the actual World Health Organization, they just said 25 grams, full stop. Um, Watch for added sugar, as I mentioned this earlier. Sugar is literally in everything, um, like ketchup. Why does ketchup need sugar? You know, it's, it's, it's a really amazing when you start looking at labels. Um, and then watch out for alternative names of sugar. So sugar has many different names. Um, just to short summary, the high fructose corn syrup, anhydrous dextrose, maltose. Anything with OSE is, is a sugar. Um, evaporated cane juice, fruit juice concentrate, those are all sugar. And I think the FDA knows that, but companies don't want you to know that sugar, so I think that's why they use those different names. Um, this is just a partial list of the alternative names, but if you go to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, there's a more thorough list. Okay, so just for context, um, so have you ever had these candies? Yes. So these are great candies, um, where there's original. Um, so I was in the office one day, <laughs> Um, at work and there's a bag of hard candy so I grabbed a couple because it was a long office and I would just kind of eat them you know while I was dictating um so then I just happened to read the nutritional facts um so three one serving is three three pieces of candy um they're just 11 grams of sugar so that's like half of your daily intake just with three candies uh, and most of us don't eat just three you know we kind of eat them throughout the day this is on top of what we normally eat so that was really eye-opening to me because just eat these without thinking about it. So, um, you know, if I just eat three or four candies like this, you know, that's it. That's as much sugar. So it, it, that actually made me think about all the small um, things we just mindlessly eat during the day. We don't think it makes much of a difference because they're small. But in reality, it could be half of your daily sugar intake. So I think the takeaway from that um, is just kind of be aware of how much sugar is in everything, and then how much you know you're actually eating. So I, I think I gave an example earlier, you know, one day I was just kind of tracking it myself and my cereal had 11 grams of sugar. You know, I put ketchup on, you know, a sandwich and ketchup had, you know, tablespoon had, you know, six grams. Okay, that's 16 right there. You know, it's a cookie at dinner and it's, it just really, I used to have orange juice for breakfast. It just all adds up. So I think the takeaways from this is that excess sugar in the diet can lead to insulin resistance, which can cause a number of health issues, including diabetes. Um, sugar can be addictive. Um, and then our goal is to try to limit sugar to 25 grams or about six teaspoons a day, if possible. Um, and just try to be aware about how much sugar we're actually eating. So I wish my video would have worked. <laughs> 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 kind of factor that in for time. <laughs> Any questions? <clears throat> uh, we have another mic. No. <clears throat> Good answer. <laughs> so before we go to question answer, we're going to open that. Um, uh, we have Dr. Madhavi Islam. Uh, and Dr. Riaz Chaudhary. Uh, they have treated people with diabetes and it's in their everyday practice. And I wondered if they have some comments at this time before we open it up. First of all, it's really a great talk. You know, a lot of research that is very You know, over the years, you know, I've written like a pamphlet my, for my patients how to lose weight and give them different ideas. And uh, my experience is simplified regimen, you 
advise them, they're more likely to follow. So 25, 30 years ago, I wrote a, uh, like a 10 points to you know, Dr. Chaudhry's weight loss program. You have, you're supposed to eat three meals no matter what. It can be small, big, different sizes. Then no snacks between meals. You can have red meat twice a week. Once a week, you can have a dessert. And then whatever carbohydrates you're eating on a daily basis, you cut that into half. So these are sort of my ideas, and of course, sort of about exercise for 150 minutes a week. And some of my patients, you know, are really committed, and they follow it. But I tell them just stop snacking. You know, in this country, we snack so much; it's unreal. No matter where you go, any office you go to, any, no matter where you visit socially, you know, there's a lot of food and sugar. So see if you quit snacking and watch your daily total caloric intake, and then of course you watch your body mass index. Uh, so then I think you will you will stay in line with uh, with the sugar part. At least that's my experience with my patients over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Riaz. I was coming to you. Yeah. Excellent talk, uh, Sophie. So a couple of things, uh, like Dr. Chaudhry's weight loss program, I am the low-carb queen. So I have a printed out low-carb diet. And I just tell patients to avoid white flour, white rice, potatoes, sugar, because they have the highest glycemic index. And then I have a list of uh, high sugar fruit. Uh, so avoiding bananas, grapes, mangoes, pineapple, watermelon. Because you see, we check people's diabetes controlled by A1Cs. And we have patients who come in during the summer and the A1C has risen a whole gram because they're just eating watermelon like it's going out of style. So, so the sugar in fruit is, you have to really avoid that. And I'm really glad you mentioned about the addictive potential of sugar with cocaine because in treating addiction, we have people who uh, are with opioid use disorder, we get them off the opioids, and then we see this massive weight. I had a patient who gained 100 pounds, because what they do then is they switch addictions, and they switch addiction to Mountain Dew, and they have 6 to 12 Mountain Dews a day. I mean, that's incomprehensible. But so this switching of addictions is the way they handle the dopamine surge because they stop the opioids and then they switch it to sugar. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So a very excellent look. The sugar is a lot cheaper than cocaine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to make um, you back to your childhood, especially people who came from overseas. <clears throat> this was the common practice that when it was time to feed the baby milk, they will warm it up and before putting it in the feeder, they will have two or three spoons of sugar. I mean, this was a common practice. And then you start out a child, a baby, on sugar. And then that remains with you all your life. Uh, I think many of us have a sweet tooth because of that. Mm. So, um, I'm going to open it up for question answer, and Razi has question or comment. Can I do without the mic? Okay, sure. It's being recorded, though. I'm sorry? It's being recorded, okay. so you need the mic. So, uh, Assalamu alaikum. You are scaring uh, him as we record it. I just want to you know, address, perhaps uh, you have already talked about it before I came. I'm sorry, I'm late. Um, but what's the relationship between food insecure household, children living in food insecure households, you know, and the issues that we're talking about, you know, which is obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up is because in Lucas County, uh, the prevalence is one in four in children living in food insecure households. Uh, one in six adults. Uh, and a lot of time as healthcare professionals, you know, we 
and I include myself in it. We not only are unaware, but also we don't take the time you know, to um, ask questions and address them. Uh, I know many uh, healthcare organizations have now started a questionnaire on social determinants of health, which is extremely important. You know, and you know, as I transition from becoming an allergy immunology specialist to a food secure task force person, uh, this is something that I see on a daily basis, uh, especially children. So my question to you is, are we seeing children, young adults, affected with some of these uh, ailments and some of these conditions that we are talking about in adults. I'm sorry, just a long comment. As long as that, <laughs> that comment was very apt. Uh, thank you, Razi. Um, I think the short answer is yes. I think we are seeing diabetes in younger kids, type 2 diabetics, and 12 year olds. Um, we are seeing insulin resistance in much younger kids. Um, obesity is a big thing. Um, for kids, so I think to answer your question, are we seeing these diseases in younger kids? I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't know if I know the answer of, of how sugar and insulin resistance, how that plays into food insecurity. I don't know if I know the right answer or have seen any research, but if I just had to, um, you know, just based on what I read, I think sugar is more available and it's cheaper. And I think poor quality food is more available. And then if you look at where people live, there's you know, food deserts. So if you live, say, in an in a urban area without a lot of grocery stores, you know, where are you going to go get food? You can't go to Whole Foods. Um, and even then, um, you know, how expensive is good food? You know, so I, I think it does, you know, I think it does make a big difference. So if you're, you have know, four kids and you're driving home from school and you stop at McDonald's, it's, you know, $5 for, you know, a whole meal versus going to Whole Foods and I don't even want to say how much money, you know, just to buy the ingredients. So I, I think that does play a big, a big role. So a quick comment. Um, the most um, uh, local food banks you know, carry uh, food items that are very high in carbohydrates and very low in protein. But you, uh, <clears throat> but uh, Razi, the Islamic food bank is not following that. Right. They are trying to have the nutritious bank. food available mm -hmm. to that bank. Mm -hmm. True? Yeah. Thank you. With everyone's help, with everyone, with all of your help. No, no, but I mean, it, it, the, we cannot decide what kind of food you should give up, right? It has to be you and the people who are with you that make a determination that every other bank is giving out the same thing like a McDonald's, right, in a can. But you have decided that you will give only nutritional food to the needy people. Any other question? Oh, you have a Quick question. Could you explain the relationship between sugar and inflammation? Sugar and inflammation. So that's a good topic or a good question because inflammation, I think, is like the buzzword. Everything is inflammation, decreased inflammation. So um, I think I can only explain this just in very basic terms. I don't know if I really understand it, but um, when you mean increase sugar, it increases the amount of cells that fight infection in the body. Um, and I think that's those cells just, they fight infection, but they also have other effects on the body. So for example, for blood vessels, um, when they're inflammatory cells, which are like macrophages, which eats bacteria basically, um, when you have an inflammatory state, those cells will, the, the white blood cells will actually take fat and put it inside blood vessels. And I don't know if I understand how I'm sure maybe somebody else can explain that, why, why that happens, but when there's increased immune kind of response, that's kind of, the actions the body takes. So um, when you have like increased inflammation in the body, um, the cells that fight infection are, are more robust in the body and then they start to do other things in the body. So they'll increase visceral fat, which is the bad fat. They'll increase triglycerides. So 
increase um, fatty deposition of blood vessels which is atherosclerosis. And I, why, I don't really know. I don't know if anyone else knows why, but I, I think it's more like a response, your body's response to just, you know, stress in the, in, in the environment. So I don't know if anyone else has a good answer. So I, I have a, no, I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Afridi has a question. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure really 100% covering what uh, the question may be, but uh, diabetics get more frequent infections, as we know as physicians, especially in the feet. And the reason for that is the high blood sugar does affect the white cells, the phagocytosis of the white cells, particularly neutrophils. So through that channel, I think the inflammation is I know, part of the game with diabetics, and, and their response is not very you know, uh, normal, like a normal person will respond to infection. Uh, thank you. Do you want to have any rebuttal for your father? Can we watch the video? Huh? Yeah, we, we found the video. Come on. Yeah. I agree with him. You agree with him, I know. <laughs> this is a really cool video. I, I just want to add that there were studies like on CRP, we call it C-reactor protein. That's a mediator of inflammation and a lot of studies that it relates to survival. Right, yeah. Like when I get my blood work done every six months, I check my CRP. If CRP is low, I'm in a good mood. Right. If CRP is up, it doesn't really indicate any particular disease, but there's some kind of diabetics, obese, right. hypertensives, uh, people who don't <laughs> exercise, they have a high CRP. <laughs> and you can monitor that year over year. So it just, Come like an index. There's some survival studies which relate to it, but it's not absolute uh, sort of relationship between survival and CRP. So I have a question. We have all kind of diets. Um, what is your opinion about all these diets being promoted? Uh, Weight Watchers and uh, that one, some beach. Keto. Keto, South Beach. Keto, South Beach, all kind of things. Are those diets keeping in mind what you talked about or it's just a fact? So I, I don't think all the diets are equal, but going back just to, to diet in general, I think I read a study somewhere that said that any, any cultures natural diet is good. So there's the Mediterranean people who eat you know, high, high um, oils and um, you know fish and don't, red, don't have red meat. And then you go to like Inuit cultures who like literally just eat walruses and just saturated, the most saturated fat and they actually have very low risk of heart disease. So it's not, I don't think it's about the type, I just think if it's about if it's natural food basically. In terms of insulin resistance, if, if that's the um, that's the focus. Um, I, the intermittent fasting, I think, is a big deal. I don't think the ketogenic diet is really um, for, intermittent, for, um, um, for insulin resistance because I think that puts you in keto, um, makes your, you're, you're converting proteins into energy. I don't think that does the same thing. Um, but in the intermittent fasting, I think, is going to be, is the new fat, I think, that is directly responsible for insulin resistance. Yeah. So we have, um but you're going to play the video, right? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Sure. The lights. <clears throat> the lights. It's, it's a short one, I think. It's, it's a short one. That just highlights. The sound? Yeah. On the This is what we eat in a day. So this is 39 tablespoons of sugar. Yeah. So he's saying basically this is what we eat in a day. This is 39 ta uh, uh, tablespoons of teaspoons, sorry, excuse me, teaspoons of sugar. And that's just in a day. So that's a lot. And then I think he said, he said how many calories that was, and it was a lot. So now we're going to go to what we eat in a week. Everybody says it. <laughs> There's just so much. Look at their face. Yeah. This is so funny. Okay. 
look at all that, and that's just empty calories and a calories. So then this is a month. I forgot how many this is. Oh my gosh. So much. We can't even lift it. <laughs> and then here's the year. So they're saying, wow, that's so much. She says, I can't believe it. And then he comes in now. This is a year. That's just sugar. Let's see what so brand. Mostly, mostly from drinks, like from pops and fruit juice. And then there's a recipe for pasta. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I just thought it was <laughs> So you mentioned no fruit juices. You didn't mean the fruit juice that you make at home. No fruit, juice. Much no fruit juice. No, no fruit juice. No fruit juice. Period. Period. Yeah. Period. Even if you get uh, healthy fruit and put them in a blender and make it. None. 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 <laughs> Can I make a comment? Sure. Amjad is absolutely stupefied because. Pakistanis are so into fruit juice. I know. Yes. I, I, oh my God, wherever you go, it's like, oh, you have to have fruit juice morning, noon, and night. It's like they think it's the thing to do. Well, that's why, look, look at us, we're healthy. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so let me finish this on a positive note. So there was a dinner party and uh, a dessert came and this one lady said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to have dessert. And the host said, ma'am, in our lifetime, an average person consumes about three tons of flour, about half a ton of sugar, I mean, this much rice, this much rice. What will this little tiny piece of, <laughs> of pie do <laughs> compared to everything else? Well, thank you very much. This was a wonderful lecture. Thank, thank you. Rasik, can you turn the lights on, please? Thank you.